Welcome everyone uh, to the uh, Socially Engaged um, Philosophy channel. And uh, today I welcome uh, two guests uh, to our channel, Manuela Fernandez Pinto from the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota and uh, Anna Leuschner from uh, the University of Wuppertal. And um, the topic I will um, discuss with Anna and um, Manuela is the topic of epistemic intimidation. And um, that's a project um, on which um, Anna and um, Manuela are currently uh, cooperating, working together. And um, it is a topic that is um, supposed to shed new light on or add another aspect um, to a topic that we have already addressed in um, several videos on this um, channel. Um, and the, the general or more general topic that I'm thinking of is um, certain ways um, of criticizing science that are problematic in some way. And that might be um, uh, being problematic in um, an epistemic way, that there's something not knowledge um, that is generated by the criticism or knowledge is undermined. And it could also be problematic in some other way, in a normative way, in a moral or political or social way, uh, or both at the same time. And um, uh, we thought that this particular topic, um, epistemic intimidation, is um, uh, adding something new to this more general topic that we have already touched upon in, uh, in a number of videos. Um, so um, just to um, introduce yourselves um, to our viewers, um, Manuela and Anna, um, could you say uh, just a few words about um, who you are and what, what you're working on? Anna, do you want to start? Yeah, I, I start. Um, hi, I'm Anna. I'm professor of philosophy of science in Wuppertal. Um, Alex already told you. Um, Wuppertal is a city in the west of Germany. I started here about a year ago. And before that, I held a number of postdoc positions in Bielefeld, where I also obtained my PhD, and then in Karlsruhe and Hanover. Um, yeah, a bit about my um, area of specialization. I work mainly in the um, area of socially relevant philosophy of science. So I'm particularly interested in the interrelation of science and society, science and values. Um, also uh, in, in feminist philosophy of science. And I have a particular interest in um, science denial, climate change denial in particular. Um, and how certain forms of science denial um, impinge upon science and scientific practices. Yeah, Manuela. Thanks, Anna. Uh, well, hi, everybody. My name is Manuela Fernandez Pinto. I'm a professor in the philosophy department and the Center of Applied Ethics at the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. And, um, well, let me tell you a little bit about my background. I got my PhD in the history and philosophy of science from the University of Notre Dame in the US. Uh, and then I uh, did a postdoc at the University of Helsinki in the Center for the Philosophy of the Social Sciences there. I then came back to Colombia where I am originally from. And I would say that my main research interests are all in the area of the science and values debate. I am, I've done work on feminist philosophy of science and I wrote my dissertation on ethnotology or the study of ignorance. And since then I'm mainly concerned about the phenomenon of the commercialization of research. So how um, recently in the past decades, um, scientific research has become more and more commercialized. Um, that is, it is uh, both funded and performed for a private commercial interest. And I am very interested in understanding how this affects, um, let's say, methodologically scientific research. And um, we have been working with Anna in this project on epistemic intimidation uh, since a couple of years ago. We've uh, written uh, one paper that has been published in philosophy of science and we are currently working on another one and we have this longer project probably um, 
uh, three years or so, uh, hope, hopefully we'll be able to write a book on the subject. Great. So I think probably a good um, way to um, enter a discussion on epistemic um, intimidation might be to um, start with um, a characterization of what we're actually talking about. So, so if you had to um, explain that, what that is on a general level, um, epistemic intimidation, how, how would you describe that? And perhaps also um, what would be concrete examples of um, intimidation that is epistemic? I don't know. Manuela, do you want to go ahead or and then Anna can add something? I actually think um, Anna should go first in this one because she she's the one who conceived the idea. Okay, um, well, let me say a few introductory words to, to the concept of epistemic intimidation. So, um, well, the, um, where to start? So there, there has been a very long debate in um, philosophy of science, or very long. I mean, it started, I would say, with Oreskes and Conway's Merchants of Doubt, um, more or less. So about 2010, on whether uh, there are certain forms of dissent in science um, that are, well, detrimental to science, that are somehow impeding scientific progress. Um, so the idea is that uh, certain forms of um, yeah criticism, and this is to be more precise, um, what we are talking about when we talk about um, uh, science denial, that this, these forms of critique are not um, are not only um, problematic for social and political reasons, but also for epistemic reasons. So it's somehow, um, problematic for science. And well, I've I've been working on this question for quite a while before I came to the idea of this concept of epistemic intimidation. Um, so when I started thinking about what makes science denial epistemically problematic, it turned out that this question is, uh, well, quite more uh, difficult to answer than it if appears um, at first glance, so in, at the beginning, I thought, well, it's, it's clear that this is a problem for science. And then I, I um, had several debates with people who said, well, what this is actually something that is intrinsically epistemically good because um, it always leads to, uh, to um, yeah, more intense debates. It's, um, it's, uh, provokes discussions, it uh, leads to new ideas, and so on. And so when I was thinking about this, I, I met Justin Biddle, who had the same intuition as me, who also thought, um, well, there is something that makes this kind of denial um, somehow problematic for science. And we finally uh, came up, roughly speaking, um, with arguing that what makes this kind of dissent epistemically problematic is basically that um, it leads to a social atmosphere and contributes to a um, societal situation in which scientists become increasingly at detrimental consequences for uh, scientific practices and then also as a consequence for the progress of science. So what we can ob uh, observe in these cases is that, that their reputation uh, becomes doubted and also that they become personally attacked. So uh, that they are, they are ridiculed. In some cases, um, for example, personal email correspondences are hacked. Um, they are threatened. They receive um, threatening letters, threatening emails, um, and so on. And this is a phenomenon that um, yeah, that increases. We can observe that, that this is an increasing phenomenon that um, leads to a systematic um, distortion of what um, not only what is uh, the, what is the topic of certain research projects, so that there is a distortion of the research agenda here, but also um, it leads to 
um, yeah, skewed research methods. So um, it influences choices of um, scientific methods. So, and the concept of epistemic intimidation, um, to come to your question now, um, is a concept um, that we think is needed here in order to uh, make clearer um, what exactly are the effects of this uh, systematic intimidation of scientists. So if we um, agree that there is such a systematic um, form of intimidation here and that this has um, a certain um, yeah, number of effects on science, um, then we think that it's uh, it would be very helpful to have a um, to have conceptual resources here that help us to um, to better understand this whole complex phenomenon, and so therefore we want to introduce this concept into this whole debate on well uh, what is um, epistemically problematic uh, critique, where are the limits of of good um, and fruitful epistemically fruitful debate and discussion. And can I just um, uh, ask one, what, one question in, in return? So just to get a grasp on, on, on a better grasp on, on, on the concept. So I mean, one could say, yeah, that, um, so for instance, people who um, deny that something like global warming exists, they are simply um, raising objections to uh, what climate scientists assert and argue for based on empirical data, period. Yeah, but um, you would say that's um, somehow um, not, com not accurate enough. Yeah, because it leaves out that, and it's not only the case that the objections raised by um, climate change deniers can themselves be criticized yeah, as themselves not being well justified or resting on false assumptions. But you um, both are saying uh, there's another dimension to these objections, namely that they are, um, they have a sort of threatening potential um, that somehow hits individual researchers. Is, is that roughly right? Yeah, that's, that's roughly right. Um, I mean, I think it's important to, uh, to emphasize that what we have in mind is not like regular scientific um, critique, um, so which is healthy for science, of course, and we're very um, important, but, um, but rather that what we have in mind is um, a particular kind of very hostile um, criticism by uh, yeah, contrarians who um, deliberately or not uh, uh, yeah, participate in a, in a form of, of huge societal um, denialism. Okay. Manuela, do you, do you want to add something? To yeah, what? well, you, you asked us to give uh, some examples, so maybe I can, I can say something in that regard. Um, so Anna and Justin have worked on um, this issue of science and denialism, uh, particularly in the case of uh, climate change denial. And so perhaps Anna has some um, uh, other cases in that respect, uh, but I would like to talk about a case uh, from the um, uh, history of the tobacco industry, uh, which is um, uh, something I'm more familiar with. And uh, here I think we have, uh, well, many cases of um, epistemic intimidation, but uh, I'll just um, uh, mention one that I think is particularly illuminating, which is the case of Takeshi Hirayama. And this uh, is the Japanese uh, scientist who uh, was the first one to identify the phenomenon of secondhand smoking. Um, and he, um, so he, he was just um, looking at this database uh, where he found that the uh, spouses, so the wives of men who smoke uh, had a higher risk of lung cancer that and other respiratory diseases than uh, the wives of men who didn't smoke. And uh, so he was the first to attempt to publish results regarding this, this new thing that he was finding out that is like there, there's something related to being close to someone who's smoking, even if you don't smoke. 
that is dangerous for your health. And the tobacco industry, um, well, basically started a campaign against Yoyama, uh, a campaign that I would call uh, of epistemic intimidation. And what they did was, uh, well, different things, but one of the most important ones was to hire a statistician to critique Yoyama's methods in his, in his um, articles. And, um, you know, they just hired him and told him, you know, you, you found any, just find anything uh, that you can critique and you, and you criticize him. And, um, and they did, and he, he, he published like a very tough critique to Hirayama. And uh, in the background, and we know this because uh, you probably are familiar with this, the, all, all the tobacco industry uh, documents related to uh, scientific research on lung cancer and other diseases are now public, you can access them. Um, and so we know that in the background, they were actually acknowledging that Hirayama was right. And th this was a big problem for them. And so they knew uh, that what he was getting at was accurate. And um, regardless, they were trying to critique him and to uh, discredit his findings. And so, um, well, this also comes together um, with uh, practices of, you know, like uh, discrediting him as a, as a, as a scientist uh, because, you know, not following the appropriate methods or, or whatever, so that the, his results, you know, are compromised because his reputation as a scientist is compromised. Um, and so this is a, 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 an interesting case, I think, of epistemic intimidation of how uh, the industry gets together and puts money into critiquing a scientist or the results that he or she gets, even though they acknowledge in the you know behind curtains that that he or she is right. Um, so yeah, so that would be my example. Yeah. So the, these two examples we talked about. Um, so one. Um, so to speak, um, intimidation of climate scientists and um, intimidation, Manuela, your example, of um, kind of biomedical scientists who did research on the link between smoking and um, uh, certain kinds of cancer, lung cancer, most importantly. Um, those could be um, classified as, um, well, examples of intim epistemic intimidation relating to or targeting um, natural sciences. Um, but would you say um, that there are also cases um, in other um, areas of science, so in the social sciences or um, even in the humanities, perhaps even in philosophy? Um, are, are there also cases you have um, worked on, uh, the two of you, or that, that are known in the literature? Or is that just, is intimidation perhaps contingently so? only something that's a problem for, um, well, for, for the natural sciences. Um, so I think that um, from an historical point of view, most cases are from, um, yeah, um, environmental and health studies. Um, so another another example that just uh, came to my mind is also uh, Rachel Carson, who um, who did this um, pioneer work um, on DDT. Um, I don't know in the sixties or so. Manuela, do you know this? Was it in the sixties? Some something like this. So these were, I think, the first cases that um, that came to uh, where yeah where people um, began to draw attention to this phenomenon because she was, she was really um, uh, very harshly attacked. Um, and so what we can observe now of what Manuela and I are arguing for in our project is that um, we can find this phenomenon now also in other research areas. Um, so uh, what you asked for, for example, um, in social uh, sciences, in particular areas, so what um, I think what spontaneously comes to mind uh, very fastly um, are gender and race studies, because in, um, we find uh, attacks against scientists, researchers in these areas um, quite often, which and these attacks are, are quite similar to the kind of attacks that um, 
I found also in climate science. So these, these people who are um, working in these areas and gender and race studies are uh, very often um, ridiculed. The whole um, research field is ridiculed. Um, the reputation of people is, is um, compromised, as Manuela also had said. And uh, so this, this seems to be um, quite analogous what we can observe here. Um, as for your question of humanities and philosophy, I have to say that I haven't thought about this so far. Um, what I could imagine is um, when we have a, a, a deeper look into um, whether we find um, this kind of uh, intimidation here, we might find um, that in certain, uh, yeah, on certain issues, debates maybe become pushed into certain directions. And I think um, one case that, that very that just right now um, uh, pops up in my mind is um, this whole uh, debate about how philosophy of science became transformed in the Cold War area. So what we saw there was, let's see, or what we see here is that um, climate scientists, uh, sorry, philosophers of science have um, been uh, intimidated on a very systematic level in the United States, um, in the um, particularly in the um, McCarthy era. So, and um, this has, as George Reich and others have argued, this has transformed the whole um, community in a way that certain research questions were suddenly um, neglected and others were become or became um, stronger. And this has led to a strong depoliticization, is that the right word? Um, so so it, it yeah. became uh, depoliticized, the whole field of philosophy of science for quite a long time. Um, that's for example, th this would maybe be one case study here, but I think when we look at the, at the present um, situation in philosophy, there might be other cases as well when we look at debates about cancer culture and other things, where I think it would, it would make sense to have a look here, but I haven't thought about this very thoroughly. Maybe Manuela has, has some other thoughts on, on this as well, something to add here. Um, no, I would like to say I, I really like this example of um, philosophy of science, and I would say philosophy more generally during, during the Cold War. I think we definitely have a, a case study there. It is interesting uh, because it, um, it also matches the social organization of science of the time. So it is, um, it is a, an um, intimidation that takes place in the political arena, right, uh, regarding um, you know, the, the political climate and governmental policies of what is appropriate and what is not to say uh, and to research. Uh, which is kind of different from the other cases we we're talking about, because in the other cases where the more recent cases, um, we have um, this uh, commercial or, or this um, private industry element in place that is not in place in this Cold War case. Um, but, but yeah, it's still a case of epistemic intimidation in philosophy, which I think is it's, it's quite interesting. I'm sure there are other cases in the humanities that we we should dig into. I just wanted to add that, um, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, Anna and I have uh, recently published a manuscript in philosophy of science uh, with the title, How Dissent on Gender Bias in Academia Affects Science and Society, uh, where we look precisely at the case of um, gender studies, and in particular, studies denying the existence of gender bias in academia. Um, so if you're uh, interested or any of your listeners are interested in, in, in knowing a little bit more about this, we, we have this paper and we're working on another paper for the case of racial bias and in particular uh, shooting bias, which is um, this bias of uh, police officers uh, regarding um, um, shooting rates depending on the race of the of their um, people they encounter. And um, so just, just to round up, I think that um, maybe social science cases might be a little bit more complex to discern than the natural science cases. 
but we think that they are definitely there. We, we think that their epistemic intimidation also occurs in, in, the, in the social sciences and the humanities and beyond. Great. So, but, so if we um, step back from these examples, so we suppose it's a, uh, these examples show that it's a fairly widespread phenomenon affecting the natural and social sciences and also parts of the um, humanities. I'm um, still um, trying to get a bit clearer on, um, partly because I'm, I'm no expert in this field, of course, of um, to distinguish two things. So one is um, there are clearly, um, let's say, non-scientifically motivated criticisms of science. Yeah, and probably climate change denial or um, uh, kind of uh, these tobacco cases uh, that were mentioned that the tobacco industry hires certain people to question biomedical knowledge, that the um, fossil fuel industry um, pays uh, people for testifying in court in order to undermine uh, certain research results of climate science. There you can say, okay, there is a sort of strategic non-epistemic economic or political interest in the background that um, drives criticisms of science and the criticisms um, themselves are um, questionable. Yeah, they rest on false assumptions, they use strange concepts, perhaps the most important or well-known example is certain climate change deniers demand proof for um, uh, global warming. But of course, science isn't really in the business of providing proofs. They do something else. They just want empirically based or confirmed um, hypotheses or models. One could argue, yeah, I'm not trying to defend a view here. So I mean, that's a well-known phenomenon. Um, but would you say that each of these cases constitutes, each of these criticisms is also um, uh, an instance of epistemic intimidation, or what? If not, what makes um, what makes some of these cases um, an, an instance of epistemic intimidation? What I got from uh, what both of you have um, commented on when expressing and introducing examples and this more general definition of the topic, it seemed to me. So, for instance, if the um, criticisms are directed at the, the scientist as a person, yeah, um, that is an indicator, but uh, perhaps also um, um, it's just a matter of content. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if the criticism contains insults, that's not really the scientific style to present um, um, uh, objections. And also, I mean, I've noticed that, um, that when I um, published something uh, in a newspaper or in some sort of um, outlet or blog that was directed at a general audience and that was co even connected to topics like science skepticism or the public image of science or something like that, all of a sudden um, you receive emails to you personally either insulting you, that's one thing, that's a clear case, something that's not very nice. Um, but also, I mean, my feeling was, and perhaps I'm asking whether you also have something like that in mind, even if the criticism as such is um, not that problematic, it somehow bothers you if people don't just respond on the blog, yeah, but send emails to you personally. And um, this is somehow too close. And the feeling is it's too close because they're not following the usual channels of criticism. And that somehow creates a feel. I mean, you could say, well, that's something you have to live with. Yeah, if you um, uh, publish something um, in a public debate or contribute something to a public debate, but still there is this feeling someone is overstepping the boundaries of what um, channels good criticism should go through, even if it is free of insults and even uh, yeah, something one could reply to if it were presented in a seminar discussion or a discussion after a talk. So I said a lot, but I'm, I'm quite curious how you would um, uh, distinguish 
cases of, let's call that science skepticism from cases uh, that are science skepticism and at the same time, cases of epistemic intimidation. Shall I start or Manuela? It's fine. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, um, so let's call it science denialism. And um, let's say that, um, well, th this presents in, in many different ways. And perhaps the most clear cut case that we have recently is the climate change um, a case and, you know, skepticism regarding global warming. Um, and I would say here, so you, you started saying, okay, it, it, there are many, let's say, uh, strategies or mechanisms um, through which this skepticism or denialism operates. And, and uh, perhaps, uh, and, and you asked us, do, do we want to call all of them um, intimidation? Or is there, is there a way of distinguish epistemic intimidation from others? And uh, so from my view, I'm also wondering if Anna agrees with this, I'm not sure. Um, but from, from my view, um, I think that epistemic intimidation is just one of many strategies that have been, um, that are being used uh, in these um, denialist campaigns. So, so again, to go back to the tobacco, tobacco case, uh, which is the case that I'm most familiar with, I, um, I wrote a paper, um, now I don't remember the date of, uh, it was published, but um, the title is uh, To Know or Better Not To, where I was trying to distinguish strategies of acnogenesis or uh, strategies used by private companies precisely to, um, obscure or manufacture doubt regarding uh, particular topics. And uh, I distinguish uh, uh, at least five different strategies. So creating or uh, buttressing the uncertainty of a certain uh, topic was one of them. Uh, and um, funding favorable research is another very common strategy. And I think among these strategies, um, epistemic intimidation or the uh, direct attack to, to scientists working on topics that are unfavorable to partisan interests is one of these strategies. So, so I wouldn't call all of the, of the mechanisms uh, used by denialists or skeptics, um, mechanisms of epistemic intimidation, but some of them are. Um, and so, yeah, in order, um, this is very useful uh, to us, Alex, because I think now, now it's clear that in, in order to um, understand this, um, how epistemic intimidation occurs, we also have to distinguish this from other strategies that are used uh, in order to uh, create doubt and, you know, among the general public. And, and, and there are probably also different types of intimidation, as you were saying. So you, you have, um, of course, direct intimidation, like someone can threaten you or someone can, you know, just insult you. And, and this is a type of intimidation, which is different from the other one you were mentioning, which is just not following the, the standard um, venues, but, you know, I don't know, calling you on your phone or sending you a private email uh, which is uh, not the way we're used to uh, addressing critique. So, um, so yeah, so, so that can be intimidating too, right? Even if they don't insult you, if they call you to your private phone, I don't know, 10 times a day, that is intimidating. And so, so yeah, there, there are probably also different types of epistemic intimidation that we should look into. I don't know, Anna, if you want to add something. Uh, yeah, I'm... I'm thinking about this uh, at this very moment. Um, I think that uh, what what we refer to when we use this concept of epistemic intimidation is um, is very broad. So um, there are many different um, ways how this um, what I called an intimidating um, social atmosphere is uh, created and all these different um, ways contribute to the establishment of such an 
um, intimidating atmosphere. So I would say, for example, when it comes to um, the manufacture of doubt, <laughs> this classical example. Um, so this creating of fake controversies is um, a crucial factor that leads to, um, well, the doubt of doubt, the publicly doubting the reputation of scientists in these fields, because it is it is important um, for questioning um, the legitimacy of this research. Then we can say, well, there, there is apparently a, a controversy going on. So um, this, is, this is just, I mean, um, doubtful research. Um, so, and I would say spontaneously now um, that all these different uh, strategies um, somehow work together um, and establish this kind of atmosphere in which scientists working in a specific field um, that is uh, affected by this by this atmosphere um, have to yeah have to be concerned uh, to um, discuss their findings and research um, openly um, and yeah without being afraid that well what comes next then um, <laughs> you see what I mean. Um, and, and, and there was also another point that you that you raised, uh, Alex, namely um, whether we have to live with this. I mean, you, if you receive, for example, such emails, I have, I've received such emails as well. Um, and I think, yes, of course, we have to live with this. I mean, this is this is the um, this is just a consequence of having um, academic freedom. Um, and I mean, where, where where should you make restrictions here you can't I mean even not not theoretically I would say um, I mean of course there are legal boundaries um, so you you are not allowed to threaten people for example to send someone a death threat or something like that that's of course I mean there's a limit uh, but a legal limit and when it comes to the well uh, to forms of intimidation that are well, legally okay, then I think, well, you somehow have to deal with this. And one hope that I have um, with this, that, that, that also motivates me to do this research is that if we understand this whole phenomenon better, and if we, um, yeah, um, establish um, also a concept here for this whole problem if, if he gives us a name and if he um, if he can openly discuss these cases and and the problems that come along with this with this whole intimidation practice um, then that might help scientists or researchers um, who uh, have to struggle with this um, yeah to to be tougher and to be better prepared and to counteract more um, uh, efficiently. That's another point I I, <clears throat> I wanted to raise is um, so I mean I I, I totally um, agree uh, after what you, both of you have said that I think um, one first has to understand what is going on yeah what what what. Um, uh, epistemic intimidation is, what different forms there are, how it interacts perhaps with other strategies for um, manufacturing doubt or for criticizing uh, sciences for uh, some strategic reason. Um, but then, of course, comes the more decisive question. So what should we do about it? How should we react um, to such uh, cases of intimidation? And I'm quite curious what, what your thoughts on, on this question are. I mean, what one could probably say, there are, um, so to speak, different um, levels we could distinguish here. I mean, what should I do or what should, what should you as individuals do about it? What should we belonging to the same community of uh, philosophy of science do about it? Um, what should um, institutions like, um, I don't know, research centers, departments, universities, um, 
I don't know, academies of science uh, and what have you. Um, how, how should they react to that? I mean, you don't have to answer all of these questions, of course, but do, do you have some idea of um, perhaps answering one of these questions? Yeah, well, I would say um, I would like to focus on the institutional level because I think that the individual's level is really, really tough to, you know, just to say what one should do in a case of epistemic uh, intimidation, especially if it's, you know, a very rough or, 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 or hard. Um, and I think there, you know, people react in many different ways, right? So there are, there are persons like individuals who are very political and they are they will speak up and you know say I won't tolerate this and there are others who feel you know completely overwhelmed and they just you know uh, step down and they just even go out you know like um, stop working in academia and things like that this is maybe similar to cases of um, of harassing right well it's a type of harassing in a way and so, and so you just uh, don't feel comfortable anymore. Why, why should I stay somewhere that I don't feel comfortable? So at the individual's level, I think this is very difficult to, to understand and to, to say how should a person react to a case like this um, uh, or what, what should he or she do. Um, but in the cases of the institutions, I think so broadly speaking, I think we, we do have a duty of um, um, defending these uh, scientists from uh, intimidation. And so the scientists, it would be ideal uh, to be in a, in a trusting environment so that the scientists could, um, you know, tell their, their supervisors or their um, chairs and you know, deans, et cetera, what was going on and to feel the, the, um, the support of the institution. Uh, I mean, in many of these cases, um, the attacks are so hard that, you know, like um, they are going after, you know, like, I don't know, government, private industry, whoever it is, they're going after the scientist's career. I mean, they're destroying the career. And so, um, yeah, we should definitely I don't know how this can be done, but there, there should definitely be strategies in place at the institutional level to block this and to protect the scientist from losing his or her career. Anna, I don't know if you have uh, more thoughts about this. Um, well, I, I agree with everything you said. Um, maybe I could add a bit more about um, the question, the normative question, whether we would like to have restrictions here somehow. Um, I've, I've already said a bit about it um, um, after your last question. Um, but one aspect that I think is, is also very important here is an aspect that has been emphasized by Philip Kitcher very often, um, namely that um, any restrictions also would have um, the negative effect that this would allow contrarians to hype um, conspiracy theories. So they could say, well, obviously we are right, or um, why, why should they oppress um, our, our standpoint otherwise? So this is, this is also known um, as the Galileo strategy. It's a real strategy that, is, that has been used um, already in the tobacco cases. And um, then we can see that it has been used in the uh, climate change denial case and and I think it's it's a it's a very common strategy in these in these um, science denial cases so that means that they present themselves as a kind of modern day Galileos who um, um, who are in the opposition in the interest of truth and if we are saying well this if we are too I mean I think we have to be cautious here um, that if, if we um, argue for restrictions, then this is highly likely that, uh, that this will be a reaction. And this, this, I think, would be counterproductive. But this is also like a side note. I mean, there are also other reasons why, why I think that restrictions are not really um, an appropriate answer um, in these cases. But 
what we really have to do is to, yeah, what Manuela has said, that um, institutions um, are protective here. And um, yeah, and, and I also think that we as, uh, as philosophers of science and, and also um, science studies uh, scholars have, um, have an important role here uh, to play by, um, yeah, investigating this problem and, 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 and making it more transparent. So um, that would also, again, um, improve institutional processes and, and also individual um, possibilities to, yeah, to um, feel more comfortable to counteract and, yeah. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I, I'm just, oh, Manuela, you have, a, you have another Yeah, I just wanted to yeah. add something uh, because uh, now, now that I hear Anna saying this, I think that um, it is very important in order to be able to do something about this, uh, to understand um, the, um, I want to say the motive, but the interest or the values uh, that are um, in place in some of these denialist campaigns. And I, I think some of the reason it is so confusing and it is so complex to understand some of these phenomenons, the phenomena, is that um, they present, like these denialists present themselves as following scientific standards. So it, you know, we were mentioning before, like going beyond the scientific venues, like, you know, giving you a call or sending you an email. But most of the time, these um, um, denialists are following what seem to be uh, the, the common venue. So they would publish research, as in the case of Hirayama that I was mentioning before, they will come to the conferences, they will raise critiques at the conferences, they will, you know, they would conduct research using grants. And so they would, they would seem to be following the venues. And I think this is part of why it is so successful is because they are, it's, they, they have like this facade that they are doing the sciences, the science that they're supposed to be doing. And when you criticize what they're doing, they're saying, no, this is just scientific criticism. We're doing it as everyone else does it. And, and, um, and yeah, and you, and you use restrictions as Anna was saying, then you will just, you know, they, they'll, they, claim, they would claim that they are right precisely because this is happening. And so, and so you become the, the the totalitarian who's restricting research and imposing um, obstacles to the freedom of research. Um, but I think it's very important to understand that this is a facade. I mean, they are not, they, they seem to be following the standards, but they do not have epistemic interest in mind. This is not what's driving their, their research or their results or their conclusions. And I, I, I also think that it is important to connect this debate with you know, science and values and to understand what are the values that are um, involved and what are the roles of the values involved in this kind of um, denialist um, campaigns or denialist results uh, in research. Because there, I think, um, lies like a crucial difference between legitimate criticism and not legitimate criticism. All right, um, and um, uh, you said in the beginning that um, you are both um, uh, you have collaborated on the topic of um, epistemic intimidation, and you, you, you're currently uh, continuing the project. So, what what are the the next steps you will take uh, in the project, or, or even beyond that? What do you think the important um, open questions are uh, regarding the topic of um, epistemic intimidation right now? Um, I can start. So um, this is not completely, um, uh, we are not completely ready to answer this question because Manuela um, has just arrived in Wuppertal for a couple of weeks. Um, and we want to discuss uh, exactly this question um, in the next uh, couple of days. Um, what we can say definitely is that we want to write a monograph um, on this topic. And um, 
then I think we have probably both collected some ideas of what has to count, what, what has to be included in this monograph um, in the, in the uh, last few months. So some ideas from my side. Um, I think uh, it would be helpful and fruitful to include um, some ideas and concepts from virtue ethics here. Um, this is because, um, or a, this, this idea came to my mind when um, Miriam Solomon gave a talk in Hanover a few years ago um, on a topic uh, that she called epistemic collusion. And there she presented a collection of individual and social um, epistemic virtues and vices. Um, and I think it might uh, help us to clarify this whole complex um, to make use of these um, of this well conceptual framework that is offered by by virtue ethics. Yeah, to um, to look into how exactly uh, certain social and individual virtues and vices are um, um, supported and and maybe accelerated um, or also oppressed on the other, on the other hand um, by epistemic intimidation. And then another idea that, um, that I also have in mind for quite a while now, um, but I haven't discussed this with Manuela so far, um, would be to have a look um, at the opposite direction. Um, so what happens if um, scientists uh, work in a field um, where the public, more generally, um, um, has uh, high hopes, yeah, such as stem cell research, where people are extremely enthusiastic about um, the, the chances that are that come along with with uh, this research. So there is an extreme enthusiasm, and I would be um, curious about how this. Um, uh, influences research in these fields. I would expect that um, what we find is that because people are overly excited here, researchers are overly excited here about stem cell research, we find a general tendency just in the in the opposite direction, namely to prefer rather false positives over false negatives. So in all these cases of epistemic intimidation, we find in empirical research fields, we find this general tendency to prefer false negatives over false um, over false positives, and I would think that in this in these cases we might find exactly the opposite. It, it might be just interesting to have a look whether we can also um, find something out about about this um, sort of uh, yeah. Um, 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 distortion to say <laughs> of science um, in these fields. But yeah, I, this is just an idea of what, what we could um, do to uh, give an, an outlook, a broader outlook of, um, of this whole phenomenon of how scientific uh, conditions influence um, science in its, in its uh, not only in the, in, in, the, in the topic that are researched, but also in, in the methods that are used. Yeah, and um, I would say that um, it, it's, uh, I'm thinking about this case of, you know, people being super enthusiastic about a particular research line. I would say uh, it's not, not only the people, but also the private companies who have interest in these in these results to be developed so i think that's also crucial for for understanding um what we prefer um but uh just to mention another topic that anna uh, perhaps um, hasn't mentioned um well of course um this idea of epistemic intimidation um is related to Miranda Fricker's uh, concept of uh, epistemic injustice. And so one of the things that we definitely have to do in the monograph is to, to highlight uh, what is the relation between epistemic intimidation and epistemic injustice, um, if they are uh, related at all. Um, so Anna has suggested to me before that epistemic intimidation might be a form of um, um, 
uh, hermeneutical injustice. And, and so we, sh we should uh, definitely um, spell that out and see if this works or not. So that, that's also something that it's in our plans. Yeah, I, I want to add a bit. Um, so the idea here is that um, what I've also said in the, in the interview now, that I think that, that we miss a concept here. So um, the concept of epistemic intimidation in these debates um, is, or that's at the moment what I, what I wish to suggest, is a form of hermeneutical injustice in fricker sense. Because it means that people who are um, affected by this kind of um, intimidation tactics um, at the moment miss a form of, they miss, they miss um, conceptual resources to really um, grasp their own experiences, to understand their own experiences and to become, um, yeah, to counteract, to, um, to discuss what they, what they experience. And then I think it's, it's um, yeah, it's a case of what Fricker calls hermeneutical justice. But I don't, I, I, I still not, I'm not sure whether there is any other really connection here between these two concepts. I mean, the, the scientists that are, affected here in climate science, for example, um, are mainly privileged white men. So that's really not what Fricke has in mind when she is talking about epistemic injustice. Um, so I am, I tend to think that um, it's not that epistemic intimidation is some form of epistemic injustice or so, um, but rather that, yeah, as I said, I think, I think it's, um, it is a form of hermeneutical injustice that we miss these uh, terminological resources and uh, that we have to do more research in this field um, to open this debate and to, to get more precise concepts here and to, yeah, to, to grasp this whole problem better. Yeah, I have a feeling I would like to ask a lot of questions about this now, how epistemic intimidation relates to uh, this phenomenon of, of epistemic injustice and also how um, intimidation relates to another bigger topic um, that I think one of, I think Anna that you mentioned uh, earlier just in passing I think when talking about how should we react um, this large topic of um, academic freedom um, so um, it's a topic we recently had a video on uh, featuring um, Heather Douglas and Maria Kornfeld now so um, my feeling is that that might be a topic for us to discuss um, in another video and not, not today, because I think it's just such a large and interesting topic and it only makes sense to uh, tackle it uh, when we have time to go really into some depth. So um, I think uh, I'd like for now to, um, to thank you for your um, great contribution to our video channel. Uh, and um, I can say uh, on behalf of the people who run it, we hope to see both of you again uh, at some point uh, in the near future on this channel. And um, to our viewers, thanks very much for watching and we hope to uh, present more videos soon. Thank you.